Today I want to talk about paw prints and in particular the anatomy of a paw print. At the TMAG, the Tasmanian Museum and Art Gallery, deep down in the bowels of the place is this vault and we call it the thylacine vault and it is the holy grail for those who seek out thylacines. The TRU team was lucky enough to get down into the vaults and while I was there the curator held up some specimens of thylacine paws for me to sketch. Here's the sketch that I did of that thylacine paw. So what I drew from was a preserved specimen of a foot. Now it's quite possible that there could be shrinking or swelling uh, but when I have a look at this other drawing from an artist Pocock back in 1926 it's fairly similar. You can sort of see the three sections of the metacarpal pad. Uh, it's got a bit more fur. Uh, with uh, Cockpo, he's actually stretched out uh, the front paw. So this is something that a scientist would do who's doing a study would be stretching things out just to see how far it would splay out. And when I look at that, I kind of think Tassie Devil because they tend to do that more so than all the specimens I've seen of thylacine. So when you look at the anatomy of a paw, what you've got here, this is what would hit the ground. Here we have the claws. Here we have the digital pads. And this is the metacarpal pad. Unless it's the back foot, and that's called the metatarsal pad. This here is often referred to as the dew claw. Now what I'm using here is the terminology used on cats and dogs because we need some sort of a reference point. And cats and dogs have very similar uh, structure to the feet, just like this. We call this convergent evolution. So on the metacarpal, the three sections that we call, they're called uh, three lobes. The reason for this, not just for balance, it is also to protect the bones that are in the limb for weight bearing. It's not three pads, it's one pad, but it got, it's got creases in there and it's got three sections. There's reasons for that. Us humans are so used to walking on man-made surfaces, we don't often think that animals don't usually walk on straight surfaces. They, they walk on undulating ground, uneven ground, and sometimes if this pad has got a bit of articulation, it can move around a bit, it's more steady footed on rough ground. And that's why you see it in cats, you see it in dogs, you see it in a lot of uh, quadruped animals. So it's not three pads, it's just one pad, but sort of three sections underneath all the skin working together. This is going to have creases, so when it lets down a, a, a poor print, it looks like sometimes there's three pads there when there's not. Um, and what you've also got to take into account is that there is diversity. Every species which is successful is a diverse species. So you're going to have fat ones, thin ones, whatever. That diversity is great for a species. When that pad hits certain surfaces, the squishiness of it is going to squash out and some of those ridges are going to disappear, it's going to flatten out and it's going to distort. So if you've got a very hard ground with a very soft layer of sand over top, it's going to spread out and you're not really going to get a great print. The best print's probably damp sand. If you can get all the fine details in the damp sand, you've got a good print to judge from. Now, if the animal is moving to the side or flicking, then you're going to get another distortion. If it's turning a corner, if it's moving around, if its claws get dragged through it, there's all sorts of reasons why it can get distorted. Another reason for distortion is erosion. And a footprint can erode to the point where it can be completely misidentified. One of the best examples of this is in Texas. In a place called Rose Glen, you've got Dinosaur Valley. You've got these theropod foots. That's a dinosaur, like an Allosaurus type creature, running around with big three toes down. And then you've got a sauropod, like a, an apatiosaur. That's uh, leaving these big round splotches down, and this is all being fossilized. 
And that area is very famous for seeing human footprints right next to dinosaur footprints. So what had happened was the theropod with its three toes coming down, those toes filled in, leaving what looked like uh, human footprints, but then that eroded out again to reveal that it was actually a theropod. So uh, sand or dirt or something coming into a paw print can, dis can distort it, confuse it, and stuff coming out can also distort and confuse a paw print. So when it comes to identifying thylacine, what you've got is the digital pads, they tend to point in. If you draw a line through there, they would all sort of point in a little bit like that. That would be when it's relaxed. If it's spread out a bit or if it hit, say, you know, hit something hard there and the toes would spread out a bit, that might distort that print. So you can never really uh, no, exactly. It depends how hard the paw print come down. We see this sort of shape here. Also notice the size of this compared to the digital toes. It's rather large. Now, dogs would normally be smaller than this. So let's have a look at a dog print. This is a typical dog print. You can see the uh, metacarpal pad there, you can see the digital pads there, and claws. If you used to draw a line down the center there, you see it's even both sides. So that symmetrical shape is usually dog, and also this pad here is quite small. It's a very typical dog. Not all dogs are typical, but that's typical dog. So not all dogs are like the one I just showed you. Some dogs very very similar to this and that's what can cause some confusion so unless you get a really good print um, in sort of like soft damp sand that captures all the fine detail it's very very hard to guess what that animal is there's a lot of things up for debate when it comes to looking at distorted prints or prints that are ambiguous or prints that we're not quite sure what they are they're just open to debate, and this does not make good evidence for thylacine.